Welcome to Reflections, a program where we discuss values and virtues for the transformation of the individual and the society in general. I am Father George Ehusani, and today I have in the studio with me my friend Clem Wankwo. Clem, you're welcome once again. Thank you, Father George. Uh, Clem was here some time ago for us to discuss issues of Nigeria. Today we want to discuss the evolution of Nigerian politics. Uh, and talking about evolution of Nigerian politics, we will try to reflect on uh, leadership and reflect on election, whether our electioneering has become better since 1999 and whether the quality of leadership is improving. Uh, Clem Wankwo uh, was the founder of uh, CLO, director of uh, CLO, one of the first, uh, the first civil first society um, uh, agency in Nigeria, active in politics and pro-democracy, uh, active to see the military out and to bring back democracy to this country between uh, 1992, uh, 93, 94 and 1999 when uh, we eventually got uh, uh, democracy. Also director of uh, CROP, Constitutional Rights Project, Rights Project uh, still on democracy and the uh, supremacy of the Constitution and the rule of law. Chairman of TMG, Transition Monitoring Group, uh, many years uh, gathering other civil society uh, activists and agents to uh, monitor uh, elections and the progress of our nascent democracy. Now. Uh, Clem is the Director of Policy and Legal Advocacy Center. Policy and Legal Advocacy uh, Center. Still involved in um, how better policies can be um, evolved in this country, advocate for better governance through the right policies uh, and the monitoring of the implementation of those policies. He is also the convener of the Nigerian Civil Society Situation Room. Uh, every election in recent years, you see Clem uh, as chairman of the group that monitors and um, observes uh, those elections. Uh, Clem, you have done a lot for Nigeria. You, you have done a lot for Nigerian uh, society, Nigerian politics, Nigerian elections. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Thank Great. you. Now, with your experience um, in Nigerian politics, during the military rule where you were active, very, very active in calling for democracy and constitutional rule. And after the military in 1999, you have been involved in the observation of elections, the monitoring of elections. You are in the right place to um, read the situation. Where are we with regards to evolution of Nigerian politics? Between 1999 and now, we are talking of 18 years, have we made some appreciable progress in the quality of politicking in Nigeria, one, in the conduct of elections, uh, in the application of standards and execution of you know, international standards. How faithful have we been in this? Are we making progress? And above all, are we making progress in the quality of persons that emerge as leaders? What kind of uh, personalities our politics throws up for, for leadership positions at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. Are we making some progress? I ask this because every time I get engaged with people discussing the challenge of Nigerian politics, people say, oh, it took America 200 years to get to where it, has, it is now. It took Britain so many years and so on and so forth. And I'm saying, but America, America manufactures a car yesterday and I'm using it in Nigeria today. Uh, Britain manufactures a refrigerator uh, yesterday and I'm using it in Nigeria. I don't wait for 200 years. So if I don't wait for 200 years to uh, use uh, all the things that, to consume all the material things that they uh, develop, why do we think we need to wait for so long to uh, fit ourselves into the international standards of leadership and, and, and governance today? What progress are we making, if any, in politics? Thank you, Father George, uh, for uh, welcoming me again to, to this program, which uh, is really uh, become very, very much a household watch uh, for, for people, uh, especially given the fact that it touches on the key issues of uh, um, moral uh, um, standing 
but also rebuilding of the country. Uh, certainly, uh, these days, you have what is called international best practice, uh, which means that there are definitions of what the world is looking to as the standard of behavior, as a standard of practice, as a standard of operation. So you don't say that because you are a country that hasn't attained a certain level of development that you do not key into those standards. standards. Uh, when the world in 1948 uh, created uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, yes. it was expected that every, every country nation. in the world mm -hmm. um, did uh, decide that they were going to be bound by those declarations. and. Um, Nigeria became bound by it. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, had its own uh, offshoots, which included uh, the rights on civil and political rights and mm -hmm. the rights on social, economic, and cultural rights. Uh, and the countries of the world began to develop along those lines. Uh, and the is issues of international best practice became even more widespread to the issue of democracy, to the issue of practice with respect to how governance happens, with respect to corruption or anti-corruption. Uh, so it, it really spread with respect to governance, with respect to elections. Uh, we were not supposed to go back uh, no. hundreds of years no, back. We were supposed to now key into the best definitions that the world has uh, created as to how we should conduct elections. Uh, as to the quality of people who emerge from elections, it's also supposed to be that there are certain standards that are expected of a country that wants to meet up with international development. Mm -hmm. There are certain kinds of people that should be running for office, that mm -hmm. should uh, play a role in the governance of a country. Uh, I, I think that given where this country started, uh, given the process of elections, given that in 1998 Nigerians came to the conclusion that the brutality of the military dictatorships of General Babangida and General and Abacha, Abacha. Uh, meant that we have taken a decision that to no move more forward, military. that we cannot have military rule in Nigeria any further. And if we are now decided, or as we have now decided that we cannot operate on the basis of dictatorship, that those standards of democracy that we should abide by should enable us to conduct free and fair elections, credible elections, true of credible individuals who would be elected into offices, and those individuals will be bound not just by the constitution, of Nigeria, but by international but standards, by international best practices and mm -hmm. code of conduct of operation of politics and governance. Uh, unfortunately, I think that when you look at the well choreographed elections of 1999 that the military put in place, and you look at what came out from that, uh, you see that it, it doesn't appear that the quality of leadership has improved. Uh, when you look at uh, former General Olusegun Gunnar who emerged president in 1999, mm -hmm. and you look at the achievements that he made, uh, you then begin to see what has happened since, since then. then. And it doesn't look like anybody who has taken over from President Obasanjo has surpassed him. Which is, for me, and it's not to say that General Obasanjo did rule such a fantastic was work. particularly fantastic. It's really the depression and even the anger that nothing has exceeded President Obasanjo's rule. That, I think, is a major indictment on us as a, a people. people. And it's something to begin to look at. When you look at the quality of the legislative houses, uh, the national and state levels, in fact, the states are even more ridiculous. But when you look at the quality, um, it's depressing. Uh, sad as the situation, depressing as the situation may be, let's say you look at the uh, national level, uh, 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 the quality of persons on the national level, like you're saying, at the local government level. And local government is so important in a democracy. So at the local government level, it appears as if we have neglected that tire of government. I mean, I was going to my home to give a talk on politics and I was going to propose that if we must redeem this land, not only in my own homeland, but in every part of this country, that retired professors should consider going to be counselors in their local government, counselors of education. So a retired professor of education should consider going to his homeland to be counselor of education. Because you see, at that level, 
he or she will be going to raise the people up haven't left that village and been exposed at that level he doesn't need the little little uh, pennies that 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 uh, those in the village are tempted to steal perhaps i i am saying that why wouldn't retired professor of engineering go to his village even if it is just to sacrifice four years go to your village and be counselor for works in your village uh, why wouldn't a minister a former minister of economics go and be in charge of uh, whatever area is a uh, uh, economic development entrepreneurship in the local government because left for touts left for political jobbers left for people who have no experience of anything apart from following politicians around to populate the, 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 the local government areas, councils, then we are not going anywhere. And you know that they do have a say as to who goes to the House of Rep, who goes to become senator, who goes to become governor. So if we do not do anything about the quality of persons that populate the councils, the 774 councils in this country, there is a, going to be a problem. Yeah, but I agree with you about uh, strengthening the structure of governance, uh, starting from the local government councils. And I, I think, in fact, that's what would make the significant difference that you need top quality people. Uh, maybe not getting retired people, because quite frankly, you need the best brains starting out from the local government and giving their best. The big challenge is the abuse of that structure. Uh, governors in the states have basically appropriated resources that should go to local, local governments. governments yes. uh, the so-called joint, joint states, account. Uh, local government joint accounts have been appropriated by governors who have turned it into an oil well from which they take and they steal and don't put it into development. So if we can get it right, and uh, we need to go back to restructuring the way the politics is organized, and that means that there must be some definition of the nature of governments that local governments represent. Mm -hmm. And people who subvert this should be held to account, including being charged with treason for subverting government at that level. But isn't there, if, isn't there some weakness, some uh, missing link, something in the, in the constitutional provisions for this joint account? Otherwise, should the state, uh, the local government chairman not collect their resources exactly in the same way that the state government are collecting? Because they are a legitimate tire of government. Well, the problem here is that you have a joint state and local government account and the state has a huge say in how that account is operated constitutionally constitutionally but, but it's, that's so you now need to go back to the constitutional framework for organizing the revenues and funding of to local adjust that and ensure that when you have a local government created that local government has its funding base has its funding structure and nobody nobody should Intervence, have the powers yes to interfere with this. Mm -hmm. Now, state governors claim that when the local government officials run it, they steal from it. As if they so, <laughs> what they've done is take responsibility as the big brother to themselves, be the ones stealing the money. And that is where the problem is. You need to have the local government's operate accounts not just get revenues, because we have to also shift away from, from uh, the rent, collection rent, of rent economy, monies from yes. the center yes. and have governments operate at the local government level that are viable. Mm -hmm. And so the whole question even of the structure of local governments, the nature, the numbers, yes. becomes important. You have 774 local governments are they viable? Uh, across the country that are not viable and not equitably even distributed. So all of these imbalances and this whole wrong start in the creation of local governments is what is coming mm -hmm. home to roost. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get back to the basics, the brass tacks, and say to yourself, what are the criteria for creating local governments? Who should create the local governments? Is it at, from the federal level where it has been created in a way that is so skewed that you can understand that it is not a politically sensitive creation mm -hmm. or economic viable creation mm -hmm. so you need to go back to that and when you do redefine it then people get elected then people who have uh, intelligence people who have the uh, willingness to serve 
now take up responsibility and then you have structures to bring those people to account should they go against the spirit of governance which See, means of, they, if they steal money if they get corrupt there are sanctions there are sanctions for part it. of the reason why i was speaking of retired people i don't mean that every every official in the local government should be a retired person but part of the reason why i was talking about that is that um people who do not need the little resources of the local government for their personal <laughs> survival people who have been successful businessmen and women successful academics successful uh, professionals who it is time for them to give back really so they are going to the local government to help the local government develop because from what I see, those who are at the local government functioning now, many of them never went anywhere. They started their career in the local government looking for, you know, some big politician to associate with and rose through the ranks to become chairman and, and councillors. I think the problem is that even the councillors get elected and the qualifications for seeking election is not stringent. So you basically would have somebody seek election to be a counselor who may not have gone to school and for them it would be really an opportunity to earn an income. Now of course if you have people who are accomplished who have earned income and mm -hmm. who may not need that much income and it's yes. difficult to determine how that can be gauged. But if you do have that then maybe you would have educated people running uh, mm -hmm. local governments. And as long as you have people who are educated and who understand the consequences of their actions running local governments, then perhaps you would see some changes. And, and also, when you have such educated people, it will be harder for some overlord, for some governor overlord, to appropriate all their money. I mean, if you have, if you have people who themselves could be governors, who themselves have all the, the, the clout, then it may be harder for some uh, governor to appropriate the resources that are supposed to go to that local government. I agree with you, but I, I think that first of all, the criteria for qualification to run for certain positions in local government, must be raised. including chairman or especially chairman, must be raised. Mm -hmm. Secondly, populating the government of local governments with elected councillors who may not have been educated and assigning supervisory roles yes. over Quali issues qualified people yeah. is a problem. So you have to have top quality qualification to run for chairman. Those chairmen should be given responsibility and be saddled with identifying people of certain qualifications as well who would run the education section, who the would run sector. the health section and all of it. So that you don't necessarily have supervisory councillors who are elected, who may not be educated, coming in and being assigned those kinds of executive responsibilities uh -huh. and portfolios let you let us create a parliament for the local government so that people who are elected on a popular basis whether they're educated or not may be the parliament for the local governments mm -hmm. but in terms of executive role mm -hmm. let it be that professionals those who run as and you abolish the whole issue of supervisory councillors, let those who run the various issues, health, education, works. environment, mm -hmm. works, and so on, be people who are appointed because of their skills and who can be removed without necessarily going back to the polls to mm -hmm. remove them. Yeah. Now, now, back to the issue of um, elections. You have been, you know, well uh, established as election observer, key election observer, monitor, and so on and so forth. What progress have we made between 1999 and now? Uh, we shall soon be engaged in election again. So what progress have we made in the character and conduct of elections in this country? Well, I, I think, like I said, the, the, the first election in 1998-99 um, was choreographed by the military. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, and after that, the election quality degenerated. Uh, no, I, I am not here talking to, of the quality of persons, but I'm talking of the quality of the, the conduct of the elections. Yes, that's what I mean. The, the, the election 
process degenerated. Oh, the, even the process. Yes. The quality of the general elections in 2007, as everybody worldwide and Nigerians uh, saw, was significantly flawed. And in 2007, the Ways Committee was created and recommendations were made. And we did see with uh, Professor Atahiru Jaga appointed uh, chairman of INEC in 2010 mm -hmm. that the quality of the 2011 elections uh, in increased. And of course, when you look at the 2015 elections, which I think was a major milestone. Yes. Given that for the first time in Nigeria's democratic experience, the opposition, the opposition party emerged. And I think looking at what has the trajectory since then, I, I have very little reason to doubt that we would not improve on the quality of that, uh, especially if we can get people to understand what their role is with elections and ensure that INEC remains independent. For instance, the various elections that have been conducted where you have the police not understanding that its role is not that of an election management agency. No. The police should take instructions from INEC and not try to run a parallel system of mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the DSS. And when we see, see the elections that happened in Anambra State recently, yes. we saw that the police, after much pressure, pushed back. And we, we are quite happy that uh, President Buhari was, in fact, able to intervene to make sure that the police Did went back interfere. to its role. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the DSS. The DSS, in fact, played what should be its ideal role with elections in Anambra, when they were very much more concerned about the threats to stop people from going out to vote, yes. rather than getting involved in management of the election, the election process. System. So that is what we need to see continue. So between ahead. 2011 and 2015, you observe a certain level of progress. I think there has been some progress, yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now, that is in the conduct of elections, thanks to God, some progress. Now what about the quality of persons because i i am quite concerned about um the quality of persons that have emerged uh, between 1999 and now you did observe that um poor as the situation may be of the eight years of abbasanjo's presidency but that we must admit that that is better than we have had since then I think it's better. I, I think that um, the big thing for politics, for politicians, is the profit that they make from participating in politics. And a lot of people who participate in politics uh, calculate the profits from it at the end of the day, whether they win or lose. The negotiations that they profit from uh, is, is a major concern that affects us. And when they get into office, rather than render service, they try to make so much more profit try to take so much more out of the public treasury and in doing that they are then preparing for the next for the next elections so you have a president who gets into office he doesn't understand what the needs of the people are he trudges on and suddenly he wakes up to the reality that it's only two two years even one year to the elections and rather than provide and deliver on development they begin to find ways of taking monies from the system and using it to prepare for the next election. So governance or leadership takes a life of its own and uh, is divorced from the people, the development. Well, certainly it, it, it means that uh, very little concern is paid to citizens. It means that the politicians are more concerned about how to pay for the next elections. And that's the point we made about the recent governorship elections in Anambra State that incredible amount of money spent hmm. to buy the election uh, on all sides was really very, very sad for our democracy. And when you look at the trials going on tied around the use of uh, security funds, whether it is the monies discovered at the uh, Ikoi, Ikoi uh, yeah. residences, those were monies that were unspent from what was spent in trying to buy the elections in 2015. Whether it is with respect to so forty three million dollars was the, just the, a change what was, change what from was left what was spent in that election. Hmm. And that is from one section because so much more monies were spent other by section. other people as well. And I don't see looking to twenty nineteen that the situation has gotten any better. 
because we might come back to the same issue of public funds being spent for the 2019 elections after that election, given what is going on. I don't think lessons have been learned even by those who are prosecuting the perpetrators of, of this the 2015 fraud. election fraud. fraud. Lessons have not been uh, uh, taken. So it saddens me looking at the electoral process, knowing that so much money is being spent, not in throwing up quality, because it means that when you are spending so much money, you're not bringing in... No, it has nothing to do with quality. No, you... You, you are buy, simply buying the electorate. You're buying the electorate. So I worry that those who are prosecuting people who stole public funds to run elections have not taken the lessons from what they are prosecuting others for and that is sad for the country i even talk about prosecution i mean how many convictions have we really gotten i mean these high profile uh, prosecutions i mean it, it's becoming more of media entertainment as far as i'm concerned because we keep every day we keep getting harassed with headlines and 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 um, scandalous uh, uh, headlines of, of corrupt deals and so on and so forth but how many how many convictions are we having is it about the weakness of the prosecution in the various agencies efcc and uh, icpc and so on or is it about the judiciary being compromised and and so on uh, what about these prosecutions? What's happening? Uh, I, I think Nigerians should begin to say, "Look, we are tired of being entertained because this is a ser these are serious issues. Let's not get be just get entertained. You rush to the press to say you caught, I mean, or you discover such fraud, but then at the end of the day, cases are thrown out in court." I think the most important achievement anybody can make for anti-corruption is to strengthen the institutions. The police, the judiciary. You have to strengthen the police. And, it, you know, previously, the laws are quite... In fact, the laws have not changed. The police have powers to prosecute or to investigate corruption. Yes, of course. Those laws have not changed. It's in the criminal uh, laws of the country. You create an agency, whatever agency it is, you should strengthen it and put in place people who, who are can capable. deliver. Yeah. It's not about theatrics. It's not about entertaining people with tales of... In fact, there was a particular incident where one of the agencies of government had seized a Range Rover car. And they brought the media to begin to show to Nigerians how the car's seats moved back and forth and how there was a fridge in the car and how there was a television in Nonsense. the car and so on. Nonsense. How does that deal with you... Manning preparing your borders. Preparing your ca case properly. Yeah, manning your borders and making sure that if people are bringing in luxury cars, they pay appropriate duty, or if they're not supposed to bring in a particular good at all, it that when those they, goods are they, come, are they, are they, they can be apprehended. Because we talk about importation of arms. For every single arm that enters that you apprehend, I believe that given the porous nature of the borders, given the weakness of the institution that so much more arms get in that are not detected yes, yes, yes. otherwise why are the cattle headsmen going about with ak-47s quite happily and easily where and there are no sanctions so where there, there, there is no effectiveness and efficiency in the manning of our borders in in, in applying sanctions when the uh, laws are violated then we live in a jungle as it were uh, father that's really where i fear the country is headed the weakness of government is incredible it's gotten even weaker and uh, the country is descending into chaos the levels of kidnap are incredible the levels, I mean, I don't understand one particular example why you would have headsmen wrecking so much havoc and, no, and, and government it, and the situation appears cannot be to condone arrested. and tolerate and assume that there is some sort of affinity between government and even the, 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 the marauding uh, headsmen. So it, it's a worrying thing. The country is descending into crisis. Government is becoming less effective, less ability to deal with issues, and, and the crisis continues. In some circumstances, it appears as if there is no government. I mean, that's what it looks. On this note, we will uh, uh, bring this segment to a close. And uh, it's been um, Clem Wankwa, well-known.
when it comes to leadership, when it comes to elections, when it comes to um, electioneering in this country and the observation and monitoring, I think this is, you, are, you remain our chairman. <laughs> Thank Clem. you, Father. Thank you very much. Thank you.